Hi, this is Chris with Investors Underground. In today's video, we're gonna cover the concepts of risk, reward, and probability, and how these three factors relate to expected value. These are fundamental and universal ideas that apply to all traders of all styles. Charlie Munger, the legendary investor, had an amazing quote. He said to take a simple idea and to take it seriously. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in today's video. The goal is for traders to walk away with a fundamental understanding of these principles and how they can use them to improve their own trading. To begin our conversation, we have to talk about expected value and what that is and how it relates to us as traders. Expected value is simply the average weighted outcome or the outcome that we could expect after doing something many times. So for traders, that means that after taking a trade setup many times, what is the net result of that over time and over many different attempts? Is it a net positive, which would be positive expected value, or is it a net negative, which is a negative expected value? This is similar to a casino and a slot machine. A slot machine has a house edge where over many different pulls of the lever, the house will end up with a profit and the player will end up with a loss. We want to do a similar thing in our trading to give ourselves an edge against the market. And after we take trades over many different times, we want that to result in a net positive for us. So as we begin our discussion on risk, reward, and probability, we're going to start with the first one, which is risk. Risk is simply the amount of money that you're willing to sacrifice if a trade goes wrong. We have to look at risk in several different lenses. We want to look at it and how risk relates to us personally, how risk relates to the instrument that we're trading, and how risk relates to the environment that we're trading in. When thinking about risk from an individual's perspective, there's several things that we want to consider. And one is what is our overall situation? We want to make sure that when we're defining the amount that we're willing to lose on a trade, that it makes sense in proportion to our overall account size and in proportion to our reaction to that. If losing $1,000 puts me in a bad mood, then that's too much risk for me, even if my account can handle it. So people have to be very introspective and think about what makes sense to them. And given their goals, their time frame, their entry, their exits, what's the appropriate amount that they should be risking? And then relating that into their position share size. Next, when we're thinking about risk, we also have to consider the instrument that we are trading. Having the same trading strategy but using two different instruments can lead to very different results. For instance, let's say someone is a short seller and they're used to shorting large caps for several percentage moves. But then they move over to the small cap space and then they are shorting something with a very low float and explosive demand. Those are very different things and so the instrument has to be taken into consideration when defining our risk. Someone might have planned to lose $500 or $1,000 but they ended up losing ten dollars or $20,000 because they did not consider the risks to the instrument that they are trading. Some things to take into consideration, understanding if it's a gamified tape or a normal tape. And that just means that is there someone in the stock that's manipulating it? Does someone control 80% of the shares and they're moving it up and down however they want to? That is a gamified tape. And that's very different than a normal tape, which means that supply and demand from many different people are determining the price of the financial asset. We also want to look at the historical volatility of this instrument. Does this have a history of making big moves or is it usually pop a little bit and then fade off or does it dip a little bit and then come back? And then we want to take into consideration the strength of the catalyst that set the stock off in the first place. We also want to consider the risks in the environment that we're trading in. Some factors that we want to focus on for environmental risk is focusing on the right setups for the right market cycles. We also want to take into consideration overall liquidity, and then we want to factor in bullishness or bearishness for the environment and then our own trades. Another consideration for environmental risks are where's the magnitude in the market? And what that means is that if we're at the beginning of a bear market, the magnitude is a lot of things are having big moves down. And so if we want to capitalize on that, we have to make sure that we have strategies that go with the magnitude of the current market cycle. So when thinking about all these different kinds of risks, we want to take into consideration whether they are controllable or whether they are uncontrollable. Many of the factors that we've talked about are controllable risks. They're things that we can spot or avoid or customize or adjust with our position sizing, with the environment, with the instrument that we're trading. But there are always some uncontrollable risks in the market. It's the nature of markets. 
There could be a devastating international event that affects markets. And what are you going to do if you're in a trade and something like that happens? We have to think about many different scenarios and many different outcomes and have a plan. Uncontrollable risks are what the market does that we have no control over, but controllable risks are things that we have control over and it's how we react. And so having things like a max stop on your account so that if everything goes wrong, you can't get destroyed by an event that has nothing to do with your trade, nothing to do with your trading strategy. So we have to make sure that we're defining our risk and preparing for uncontrollable situations. The next part of our discussion will be on reward. And that is the amount of money that we can reasonably expect to make if the trade goes well. We always want to have a positive reward to risk ratio. And whether that's three to one or five to one or 10 to one, the higher the better. And so we are always trying to decrease our risk, but we are always trying to increase our reward. And that reward to risk ratio is hugely important in trading and greatly impacts our expected value as traders. Having a high reward to risk ratio enables us to make many, many mistakes and still come out as profitable traders. If I have a five to one reward to risk ratio, I can be wrong four times. And if I'm right on the fifth, then I break even. And that's a powerful concept to take into trading. When thinking about reward from an individual perspective, we have to make sure that a trade is within our circle of competence, and that just means that are we actually able to accurately estimate the reward potential of this trade? It's one thing to say that, oh, I expect to make 10 times my money relative to the risk I'm taking, but if you don't have the data or if you don't have the experience to really play that through, then it's meaningless. And so we have to make sure that what we are trading is within our circle of competence and we're able to accurately measure potential reward. Another consideration for us to take into account is our ability to overcome greed. Many traders have a trade that's going well and then they hold too long and they turn a big winner into a loser. If we are taking a trade with an expected reward amount, once we get there, we should be protecting that and not willing to go all the way backwards just because it looks like it might go a little bit higher. We have to stick to our plan and if we have the opportunity to still participate in a trade as it goes well, we can move up our stops along the way, but we want to protect our initial plan as well. Here are some key factors to consider with reward as it relates to the instrument that we're trading and the environment that we're trading it in. We want to be able to anticipate range. We want to do a life cycle analysis. That means that as I'm thinking about a trade, if it's a breakout trade, what is the life cycle of that? That means that demand came in, maybe shorts cover, and then the move stops. That is the life cycle of that trade. And it could be similar for a short seller who's considering entering a position when a stock is breaking down and they're assuming a lot of supply is going to come on the market and then they will be able to participate in that waterfall down. We also want to think about the target area, whether that's looking left at historical points of resistance or support, or whether it's based on capitulation or volume or other factors, we need to be able to have a target area in mind when taking our trades and especially for locking in our reward once we get there. We want to look at the strength of the catalyst that's moving the stock. How is that going to impact supply and demand? We also want to take into account the liquidity, the macro environment, the market capitalization, the float, and the gamified tape versus normal when it comes to reward as well as risk. The next part of our discussion relates to probability, which is defined as the percentage amount of time that when I have a trade thesis, it plays out in a way that I expect. Am I accurate in predicting what is going to happen? And so with probability, it's very important to us that we have high probability setups, which means that when we take a trade, we want there to be a good chance of it playing out. This plays into our risk, reward, and probability calculation for expected value. I might have a great reward to risk ratio, but if I have a very low probability, then I can have a negative expected value instead of a positive expected value. An example of this is the lottery. You might have a huge payout if you're right, but if the probability of achieving that payout is so low, it makes it a negative expected value activity. And so we should avoid trades that have a very low probability of success. There are no perfect measurements for probability. Rather, the information is gathered based on historical data, observable current data, or by modeling after someone else who has a successful strategy that has worked well for them over time. We are taking into account many different variables to give us the highest chance possible that a trade will work. 
And by understanding the structure behind the trade, we can also increase our probability. For example, if we're looking at what we call a liquidity trap situation, which is where a stock runs up and then it consolidates and then the volume comes back in and it breaks out again. If we understand the structure of that and why it works, then we have a better probability of being right when we see that. We know that the structure is that longs and shorts both get into the stock, then the stock goes sideways, and then the volume drops off. And then when the volume picks back up, someone has to get out. Either the longs have to get out and the stock goes down, or the shorts have to get out and the stock goes up. And so if we are banking our probability on the shorts getting out and the stock going up, then once that cover comes in and once the shorts get blown out, that is the end of the structure. That is the end of the life cycle of that trade. And so if we want to increase our probability, we have to understand the structure behind the probability in order to accurately estimate the outcomes. One of the keys to increasing your probability of being right as a trader is to look for a confluence of factors, many different variables all moving in the same direction. And the more of those variables that join along, the higher the probability that the stock plays out the way that you want it to. So now that we've looked at risk, reward, and probability in theory, let's look at them in practice. Up on the chart, I have SPRC, and this is one of Nate's trades from several months ago. You can see the area where he entered and the area where he exited. He had a trade thesis in place, and when he entered at around that $9 mark, he expected to stop out if the stock was breaking below that $8.50 mark. And so his risk was defined for the trade at around 50 cents per share. Now, if you look at where the stock went to, it went all the way up into the $13 range. Now, he scaled out along the way, and so let's call his exit around the 12 mark. And so when we look at this chart, we can clearly see where the risk was defined, where the reward was targeted, and then what was the probability of this happening is based on Nate's understanding of the trade setup. So if we were to take that trade and to put it into terms of the expected value formula, here's what we would come out with. We had a 50 cent risk per share. We had an expected $3 of reward per share. And then we subtract the 50% chance that we would lose 50 cents per share. And so that all comes out to an expected value of $1.25 per share. And so what that means is that over time, over 10 trades or 100 trades or 1,000 trades, you could expect to reasonably get $1.25 of profit per share that you traded. And so whether you traded 1,000 shares or 10,000 shares or 100,000 shares, you would have a positive expected value based on the risk, the reward, and the probability. Let's take a look on the stock HARP and the trade that Nate had on it to demonstrate how risk, reward, and probability came together for a positive expected value trade. Now Nate was waiting for this stock to break under that $9 mark. And so he put on his short position and scaled in to around an 850 average. Then he was looking for the failed follow through with the setup, which increased his probability. And it rode all the way down and he covered at that $6 mark. And so he made $2.50 per share on that trade. He was risking about 50 cents if he was wrong, and he made $2.50 if he was right. That is a great reward to risk ratio. Let's see how this trade looks in the expected value formula. So I estimated that Nate had a 60% chance of being right on that trade and a 40% chance of being wrong. So we'll take the probability of being right, which is 60% times the 250, and then we'll subtract the 40% chance of losing 50 cents on that trade if you were wrong. Now, the expected value of that trade was $1.30 per share. So that means that if you were to take that trade 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times, Given the same setup, we could reasonably expect to make $1.30 per share on that trade. We've covered a lot of ground in this video. We've looked at how risk, reward, and probability all come together to shape the expected value of the trades that we take. We want to take the simple idea and take it seriously. So with risk, we looked at it from the perspective of an individual, from the perspective of the instrument that we're trading, and the perspective of the environment that we're trading it in. And we did the same for reward and for probability. We've demonstrated how this can be used in real life to have profitable trades that are done by experienced traders over and over again. I invite you to check out Investors Underground, where they have some of the best technology and best traders in the game, all working together to beat markets. 
These are the kinds of things that can help you to lower your risk, raise your reward, and raise your probability so that you can have a positive expected value in your trading. Thank you.